Hello everyone, and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series in which we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at the Spirit Squadron Precon, which we'll be bringing up from its $30 price point to the typical $65 of our usual Cutrate Commander builds. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and game plan. The face commander for the Spirit Squadron Precon is Millicent Restless Revenant, a 4-4 Spirit Soldier with flying that costs 5, a white, and a blue with the following abilities. This spell costs 1 less to cast for each spirit you control. Whenever Millicent Restless Revenant or another non-token spirit you control dies or deals combat damage to a player, create a 1-1 white spirit token with flying. Right out of the gate, we can see that Millicent is sporting a huge CMC, mid-sized stats on an evasive body, and both a means to make her massive mana cost more manageable by having spirits on board, and adding to their numbers once she gets there. Her first ability is straightforward enough, incentivizing us to run spirits to reduce her cost by one each, which can help reduce her massive base mana value down to a measly blue and white, and allow her to hit the board much faster than her high CMC would indicate. This then works nicely with her second ability, allowing us to use the same spirits that were used to reduce her cost to flood the board with evasive spirit tokens turn after turn, quickly overwhelming the board with tokens so long as we keep attacking. So, aiming to make the most out of our Commander Spirit-focused abilities, this upgrade will be tweaking the Precon into a more aggressive Evasive Spirit Tribal direction, focusing on low CMC Evasive Spirit creatures and Spirit Token generation. The core deck already has a fair amount of low-cost spirits with flying that work well to reduce our Commander's costs in the early game, who can then safely get in for damage to enable our Commander to generate even more spirits when she gets on board. So adding to that number while swapping out our less effective spirits and non-spirits will help us get our Commander out and enable her token production more efficiently. Spirit token generating creatures will also help us accomplish this, whether they be spirits themselves or non-spirits. Either way, helping us reduce the cost of our commander with the tokens they create, and then help us to continue to flood the board with even more spectral bodies alongside her. And of course, being an Azorius, we have plenty of spirit payoffs to make our spirit army that much more potent, ranging from spirit lords to make our humble one ones into much bigger threats, to means of getting extra value out of our tribe with draw protection and disruption effects for additional utility. From there, we'll be tweaking our deck to take advantage of our aggressive playstyle by including some sources of offensive card draw to keep our hands full as we swing in, and counter spells and protection sources to make sure our spectral army doesn't get exercised with a well-timed wipe. So let us unleash this horde of restless souls against their enemies, their haunting cries for retribution striking dread into the guilty. With Millicent leading them, this torrent of souls will sweep across Innistrad to ensure justice is served for each and every soul responsible for their demise. Then and only then will they know the peace of the blessed sleep. So now that we have a better understanding of the commander and the game plan that we're going for, let's take a look at the cards that we'll be keeping from the core build. Starting with the creatures, we'll want to keep most of the smaller evasive bodies in the core deck to help enable our commander. Spectral Sailor and Ghostly Pilferer are good keeps to hit the ground early and provide us with card advantage, while Rattle Chains, Shacklegeist, and Supreme Phantom will provide decent tribal support with protection, disruption, and anthems respectively. Remorseful Cleric also stays in, thanks to being a superb source of graveyard hate on top of being a well-costed evasive body. Moving on to our more mid-sized evasive spirits, Bygone Bishop and Ethereal Investigator keep their spots for being decent sources of card advantage thanks to their clue generation. Drogskull Captain and Drogskull Reinforcements stay in for the good stat boost and keywords they provide our spirits, the latter not being evasive but the AoE melee more than making up for it. And Nebelgast Herald and Spectral Arcanist remain for the spirit matter payoffs they provide, those being Disruption and Spell Recursion respectively. Hanged Executioner makes the cut for being a decent exile-based removal effect and creating a token as it ETBs to get us more spectral bodies on board, as does Spectral Shepherd for providing protection to our spirits by bouncing them to hand if needed, and Windborn Muse for preventing attacks unless our opponents are willing to pay the toll. Then we close out our spirits with the largest ones we'll be keeping from the core build, those being Sire of the Storm and Oyobi who split the heavens, the former giving us extra card advantage as we play our spirits, and the latter giving us bigger evasive spirit tokens instead, both serving as decent top-end spirit matter payoffs for our build. Then closing out the creatures from the core build, we'll be including some non-spirits, starting with Mirror Entity, who is technically a spirit thanks to Changeling and gives us a way to pump our entire board massively for potent alpha strikes, Priest of the Blessed Graph, who can easily give us three more spirits per turn due to our color combination not having a lot of access to land-based ramp, Angel of Flight Alabaster, who gives us a repeatable source of recursion for our spirits while also being a decent evasive body itself, and finally Donal, Herald of Wings, giving us yet another source of spirit token creation as the vast majority of our deck has flying, as well as allowing us to double up on some of our more potent abilities. Moving on to our instance, Swords to Plowshares and Arcane Denial stay in for being cheap and effective removal options despite their downsides, as does Benevolent Offering for its instant speed token creation and life gain, in addition to the opportunity for politicking it provides. 
Looking at the sorceries from the core build, Distance Melody makes the cut for the tribal focus draw it provides for our spirits, as do Fell the Mighty and Kirtar's Wrath, each being a relatively decent board wipe that either leaves our board relatively untouched, or at least leaves us with some bodies after it resolves. Storm of Souls also stays in thanks to the ability it has to rebuild our board instantly if we've been experiencing heavy losses, usually putting us back in the game if it resolves despite our creatures coming back as 1-1s since most of our creatures don't have high stats to begin with. For core enchantments, both Darksteel Mutation and Imprisoned on the Moon stay for being good non-destruction removal options, especially when dealing with commanders. Haunted Library and Field of Souls remain for being good sources of spirit tokens as both our opponents and our creatures die off, and Breath of the Sleepless keeps its spot mainly for the tribal flash it provides to all our spirits, but its tap-down effect can also provide decent disruption when applicable. Reconnaissance Mission then closes out our core enchantments, earning its spot by being a superb piece of card advantage that suits our aggressive playstyle and, though we would loathe to do it, does give us the option to cantrip it if we absolutely need to. Moving on to our core artifacts, we'll need to make sure to keep our most potent mana rocks, those being Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Azoria Signet, Marble Diamond, and Sky Diamond, all of which help us speed up our mana base efficiently, as well as Midnight Clock, which serves as an okay rock but, more importantly, enables us to dump our hand quickly into play and to get a fresh one after a few turns. Finally reaching our lands, we'll be keeping our more efficient lands that tap for both our colors and can come into play untapped, those being Command Tower, Port Town, Prairie Stream, and Sky Cloud Expanse, all of which help fix our mana without sacrificing speed, as well as slower options like Temple of Enlightenment for the scry it provides, and Myriad Landscape for the land-based ramp it gives us access to. And the tribal-focused lands of Unclaimed Territory and Path of Ancestry will also be staying in for the fixing and utility they provide for our spirit tribal build. Then for our core utility lands, we'll be keeping the only one included in the core deck, that being Moreland Haunt, to allow us to recycle our used-up creatures to get additional 1-1 flying spirits for more board presence. Then we close out by keeping 11 planes and 11 islands from our core basic lands. That leaves us with a final tally of 72 cards including basic lands we'll be keeping from the core build, leaving us with 28 cards to replace. But before we go over those replacements, let's briefly go over some of the core cards we're swapping out and why they didn't make the cut. Starting with the creatures, we'll be getting rid of any spirits that don't fit our aggressive, evasive game plan. Kami of the Crescent Moon, for example, doesn't do anything for us, as we have no real way to take advantage of the symmetrical card draw it provides. Geist of St. Traft can't get in for damage reliably on its own to trigger its own or our commander's ability to spawn tokens. Twilight Dover's token creation is too slow in this build, as we can't reliably remove our own tokens to enable it to create more for us. And Karmic Guide, who, while effective, will typically only reanimate a low CMC spirit, so it's not worth running. We'll also be cutting a whole lot of non-spirits from the core build that don't do enough for us, with some standouts being Mentor of the Meek and Knight of the White Orchid, both of which are excellent sources of card advantage and ramp respectively, but ultimately got cut for more offensive card draw and more flexible ramp. The partner pairing of Rhoda and Timon also got the axe, as the core deck doesn't have enough tap-down effects to make the most out of their abilities, though they are fully capable of helming a tap-down build perfectly fine on their own. Moving on to Cut Instance, Sudden Salvation and Disorder in the Court get cut since the protection they provide is a bit too limited for our go-wide playstyle. Crush Contraband, which is a perfectly serviceable back row removal tool, ultimately got cut for cheaper disruption, and Occult Epiphany, while decent at generating spirit tokens, ultimately lost out due to our deck not being specced to take advantage of the graveyard setup it provides. For Sorceries, Haunting Imitation was replaced for its potential to whiff or just being too unreliable for its 3 CMC cost, as was Flood of Tears since we have better board wipe options that are more geared towards our spirit-focused playstyle. Looking at our enchantment cuts, Verity Circle fails to make it since we don't have enough tap-down effects to warrant running it, as does Promise of Buniri which is a bit too slow in its token creation, and Ghostly Prison which would make a great addition to any pillow fort deck but is only so-so in this one so it gets the axe. Looking at our artifact cuts, only two of our less effective rocks get swapped out, those being Azorius Locket and Commander Sphere, both of which are fine but ultimately get replaced with more efficient ramp sources. The only Planeswalker in the core build also gets cut, as while Dovin Grand Arbiter can provide card advantage with his alt and can get there fairly quickly thanks to our go-wide playstyle, he fails to provide any utility outside of what other sources could provide better than he can. Finally reaching our land cuts, we're cutting Temple of the False Gods as it's an actively bad land to run unless we have a land focused deck, and Azorius Chantry which is slow and can actively hurt us if we don't draw into more lands in the early game. So now that we've covered some of the cuts, let's move on to the deck's upgrades. Looking at our creatures first, we'll be adding some low cost evasive spirits to lower our curve. Mausoleum Wanderer makes for an excellent one-drop that gets bigger as we play more spirits and even gives us an onboard counter to disrupt our opponent's plays. Clarion Spirit, while not being evasive itself, provides us with an excellent source of evasive spirit tokens as we play our low CMC spells. And Spectral Adversary gives us a scalable threat that also serves as a decent source of protection against removal and wipes for our key creatures and enchantments. 
The legendary's Danik Pius Apprentice and Dorothea Vengeful Victim will also be added, the former giving us some initial graveyard hate and later becoming an evasive spirit that can give us additional card advantage through clue generation, and the latter starting off as a huge evasive stat block that later turns into a tribal version of Geist of St. Traft to enable our commander even further by producing and sacking spirit tokens. Moving on to bigger spirits, we'll be adding Patrician Geist and Empyrean Eagle as lords to empower our spirits and flying creatures respectively, Guardian of Faith and Curia Great Glass Spinner as a means to protect our boards from targeted removal and wipes, and Dream Shackle Geist and Spell Queller to serve as a pair of disruption sources, tapping down our opponent's creatures or countering their spells respectively. Then we close out our creature additions with Mirror Hall Mimic, who gives us a spirit version of the best creature on the board initially, and later becomes even more fearsome by creating a spirit token copy of it every turn instead, and Catilda Donhart Martyr, who serves as a potent spirit payoff that just keeps growing in pace with our board state, while later transferring its growth to another target from the grave. For instance, we'll be adding the Counterspell suite of Counterspell, Negate, and Unified Will to disrupt our opponent's board states while protecting our own, and Thassa's Intervention, which can serve as an additional Counterspell or a source of card selection and card advantage if we need it to. Looking at our sorcery upgrades, we'll be adding a single entry with March of Souls, which serves as a board wipe that effectively lets us keep our 1-1 spirits, which helps us keep our spirit count high in order to recast our commander or for any spirit payoffs we may be playing on the following turns. For new enchantments, Military Intelligence gives us some early card advantage every time we swing in with our evasive creatures, Spirit Bonds lets us generate even more spirits as we summon our creatures and can occasionally let us protect our non-spirits from destruction, and finally Reflections of Lechara, while expensive, lets us double up on all our spirits moving forward for an insane amount of value. For artifact upgrades, we'll be adding some Ramp with Wayfarer's Bobble and Prismatic Lens, both of which drop early to quicken our mana generation, and Bidens of Thassa, effectively giving us an additional copy of Reconnaissance Mission to draw us even more cards as we swing in with our evasive spirits. Finally reaching our new lands, we'll be subbing in Nimbus Maze for another dual land that comes into play untapped to fix our mana without sacrificing speed, and the utility lands Castle Vantress and Windbrisk Kites, the former giving us some additional card selection from the land slot, and the latter enabling us to cast a free spell with an easy to meet condition. And lastly, we'll be adding a basic island to help smooth out our more blue-looking mana curve. So now that we've looked over all the changes, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. Our final build currently has 35 creatures including the commander, 7 instants, 5 sorceries, 9 enchantments, 9 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 35 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 32 spirits, 27 creatures with flying or other forms of evasion, 17 sources of evasive spirit token creation, 21 cards that care about spirits, and 12 counters and protection sources, giving our final build plenty of evasive spirits and spirit tokens to get in for damage and enable our commander, plenty of payoffs to allow us to benefit from or empower them further, and a decent number of ways to keep our board state intact with protection effects and spell disruption. For general deck stats, we have 9 ramp sources, 12 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 3 board wipes. Our ramp being a bit lower than normal due to our low to the ground curve, but our other stats remain within typical range. Looking at our mana curve, we have 5 1 drops, 23 2 drops, 16 3 drops, 12 4 drops, 5 5 drops, 3 6 drops, and 2 7 drops, giving us an aggressive curve to quickly get our spirits and payoffs on board, enabling us to get our commander on board quickly and flood the board with even more spirits. This brings the final price of the deck to be 64.20 after upgrades. This price does not include tax and assumes the price that you paid for the precon was $30. The price of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For some upgrades, Selfless Spirit is a great way to protect our entire board by sacking itself and can serve as a cheap evasive body to swing in with in the meantime, Cemetery Illuminator gives us a way to play our spirits from the top of our deck for some good card advantage, and Cathar's Crusade serves as a good way to permanently pump our whole board thanks to the cheap creatures and token production sources we have. And finally, Kindred Discovery and Anointed Procession make for superb sources of tribal card advantage and spirit token production respectively, though they'll cause the soul of our wallets to join Melisin's Spectral Army if we choose to add them. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Let me know in the comments if you like these shorter form video formats for pre-cons in the comments, or if there are any changes that you feel I should make. I'll be putting out a poll for your feedback in the near future, so keep an eye out so I can improve these videos for the next batch of pre-cons. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And if any of you feel like supporting the channel in a different way, please consider checking out the other deck text floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cut Raid Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.